So let's get started. Um, Rebecca Michael, the um, advocacy manager for the Independence Center, and I am with Daniel Ratcliffe, the president of the United States. Yeah, you wish. Okay, Daniel Ratcliffe, benefits coordinator <laughs> at the Independence Center. This is the Real Empowerment Podcast, and we have two guests here that we're um, very interested to, to kind of dig into the information that they have. So um, we have Chris and um, Alex. They're going to come and talk to us about um, World AIDS Day and um, AIDS Awareness Month. So go ahead and introduce yourselves, and we'll jump right in. I'm Alexander Hoffman. I am a case manager at the Southern Colorado Health Network, formerly known as the Southern Colorado AIDS Project. And I'm Chris Robertson. I'm an independent living manager at um, the Independent Center. Nice. And you formerly of? Formerly of uh, SCAP or Southern Colorado Health Network. Gotcha. So we stole him from SCAP. Swipe or, or no swiping. Yeah, I know. Hey, you know, when you when you have something good, you have to get other good people. Oh, yeah. That's what they say. <laughs> I don't know what happened with you and me, but <laughs> hey, <laughs> thanks. They're, they're still evaluating us. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so the reason why we're here is we wanted to um, to talk about a, um, a disability that is almost one that, that isn't brought up because of stigma. Mm-hmm. And um, it's really relevant to our our least my generation you're kind of younger than me aren't you um just slightly i, I yeah. don't want to embarrass you <laughs> but within my um well, as i was growing up i remember seeing on tv the um the quilt that was mm-hmm. laid out on was it the mall in washington yeah, yeah, yeah. it yeah. was yeah and um i really didn't have any really good context for that um my mom has always been a very open person about anything that could possibly impact a person either in health wise or disability wise just because I would grow up with a disability but there was so much information that was not provided to the public when I was growing up that we didn't really know anything about yeah. transmission we were just terrified right exactly mm-hmm. so I'm really excited to hear what you guys have to um, to tell us about and we'll hopefully dig into some good information and you know we are not afraid of medical terms so don't be afraid to use those we may need a little bit of context i need a lot of bit of context i am not a doctor <laughs> even though you know daniel thinks he is we are not doctors either My so. is hard <laughs> dr don't true <laughs> i am a medical case manager and that means i have a little bit more knowledge than the general population yeah. so cool medical records that's what we day. need yeah so we'll take it so let's talk about um history who wants to start? Chris, I'll let you go. So the history of World AIDS Day is, well, World AIDS Month is in the month of December. World AIDS Day is December 1st. And the first World AIDS Day took place in 1988. Um, AIDS became um, diagnosed um, by, the, by the, the medical population in 1981. Yeah. was the first, oh. I think there were five cases from San Francisco. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And... Um, then it exploded. What the, the, they didn't know then, but they eventually found out, was it takes 10 or 11 years for the virus to incubate in the human body before the cascade happens and you um, and you get AIDS. So, so first of all, I want to do some definitions. Okay. HIV is the virus that causes AIDS, okay. and it's a humo, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, humo, okay. mm-hmm. human immunodeficiency virus virus and then aids is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome Syndrome. yes Mm -hmm. a i d s so um i remember because i'm kind of old that (laughs) i came out in 1982 and this thing was out there i came out in the city of new orleans and um we were all scared to death and so in 1982 i heard that there were a few people like a handful or two handfuls that had this weird cancer like grid was gay related um immunodeficiency disease and um in the south where i'm from um the kind of illnesses that people started to get and it really did explode and in the next five years i saw a lot of pneumocystis pneumonia and i saw a lot of copersi sarcoma and copersi sarcoma is a form of cancer not really cancer cancer but Mm -hmm. it manifests on the skin and so you could oh, see, okay. um, I could see the face of AIDS. 
lesions. and it was lesions. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so um, for me, it was very scary. I saw the re- I saw it, and what people don't see today is the face of AIDS because it really drugs have advanced so much that um, we keep it under wraps, under control. Sure. And that's where the the invisible disability comes in. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And you know what's what's really kind of surprising to at least the advocacy staff um, at the IC is when we hear a lot of of the the term of hidden disability. And we had a conversation about this with a consumer. I don't know about I want to say about a month ago, and they kept referring to their disability as well. It's a hidden disability, mm-hmm. and and I asked the consumer, do you intentionally hide it? And they're like, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't intentionally hide it. And I said, well, then don't call it a hidden disability because you're not hiding something. Mm-hmm. And um, the consumer said, well, other people refer to it as a hidden disability in order to, um, to discriminate against me. Because Stigma I'm hiding, a, yes, yes, I'm yes. hiding something from them. Mm-hmm. Well, I can't hide something if, my, if the drugs are keeping a disease under control. Yeah. So um, I thought that was a really interesting conversation. It kind of hurt my heart a little bit yeah. because someone is not intentionally hiding a disability. It's just, you know, the medical the, the medical community has found ways to keep things under control so people can live longer and healthier lives. But isn't that always the case that if you're in a wheelchair, it's obvious that right. you have this disability. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. d- depending on what what malady you have um it is called hidden yeah and i would say that hiv is a hidden disability Mm -hmm. because of the stigma yeah so there's a difference in how um how the person who has hiv sees themselves Mm -hmm. yeah true they would rather not let everyone know that they have a disability yeah the interesting thing is there there's no look to it you know, right. I can remember being younger and they were like, oh, this person is sick and they have AIDS. And you're like, oh, they don't look like they have AIDS, but mm-hmm. there was no there's there is no look. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's so important to be careful and practice safe sex and all of those things, because mm-hmm. there's no way to know. Well, nowadays, <laughs> there are some some advancements in technology right. where you can test in mm-hmm. right. in home. Mm-hmm. Uh, but back then it was like, you know, oh, stay away. You know, I can remember one of my uh, my church members had AIDS and I was maybe only seven years old and he was very close to my family. And I can remember the day he passed away going up to the hospital. And when I walked into the room, they stopped me. They did not want me to see Mm because they did not have the medicine back then. This was in the Mm nineties and I saw, and it was not good at all. It it was, it, it really scared the the crap out of me I almost cursed excuse me it really scared me mm-hmm. and uh it made me aware of the condition and it also made me want to know more about it of how do I make sure that I am not the person laying on this hospital bed mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. yeah but yeah man yeah very interesting I went down the rabbit hole of the history of AIDS and uh, I believe that uh, the first cases were announced in december of 81 81 Mm -hmm. yeah so now i understand why world's aids day is december 1st december 1st right and And awareness month is december oh look at you i had no idea yeah yeah i did some research i did (laughs) some research man i learned about who i I thought who was the band (laughs) um and it's the world health organization Organization. sure (laughs) i was like okay (laughs) look at me (laughs) i'm all educated now (laughs) oh jeez (laughs) <laughs> no, let's let's go a little deeper into um, the history of AIDS in in, um, in America, and that uh, I guess the transition into today, where now AIDS is kind of controllable, mm-hmm. you know, if you take the right steps. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So I think that you know we can dive into that a little bit more with um, you know let's look at El Paso County and what's okay. happening here and what um, the Southern Colorado Health network yeah. um, is doing so you what, what is your coverage area we cover 25 counties in southern colorado um and that's like pueblo alamoso i i've gotten a lineman for a client mm-hmm. um since i've been a five years at a chn um so that's what we cover we cover anyone anyone nice. male female nice. we've had as young as 15 years old being diagnosed in our office we do testing 
wow. young as 15. I've had, um, I think my oldest clients have been up in their 70s. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. Any Amazing. age, any race, any ethnicity, wow. any sexuality, it can affect. So let's talk about a little bit of the statistics around, um, about who is, who, like, let's talk about the face of, of AIDS right now and, mm. and HIV and who has it. What's the statistics around that? Yeah. Because we hear a population. lot of the, it's only a, um, a gay mm-hmm. yeah. virus, yes. mm-hmm. but truly that's not the case. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, women, Chris and I discussed how I believe it's 20% mm-hmm. of all HIV infections are women wow. and they're women of color. Latina, um, African American. It's devastating, really. Part of what causes that is the down low, the mm-hmm. down low um, phenomena, basically. Uh-huh. Gotcha. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but allow me to explain it. Yeah. It is um, men who have sex with men um, who do not, who do not feel that they are gay. Um, go get a little action on the side, uh-huh. and they come home and ra- they bring it to their women. It really is a true thing that's going on, and it's happening a lot in the African community, com- African American community, and the Latino community. It's pretty impactful. Sure. Many of our women clients are women of color. Um, I do have a few Caucasian clients mm-hmm. who are women. Mm-hmm. Um, every every I believe it's March. We have a women's um, a women and girls national. HIV AIDS Awareness Day. We do a luncheon. SCHN does a luncheon um, to recognize that. Um, we have women's wellness groups at SCHN. Pardon me if I'm using my acronym too much. <laughs> but we do, at my work, we do have a, we have um, a luncheon and then we have a retreat that's going to be coming up this next month, which is really exciting. I get to be a, um, a big part of that. Um, it's a therapeutic retreat that we give our women um, once a year. We do it, we're going to do it at the San Franciscan um, Retreat Center this year, but we've done it in Black Forest in the past, where we just have three days with these women who are HIV positive. We have 16 women signed up right now, which is huge. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and we do stigma workshops. We do nice. medical workshops. Um, I'm going to lead a workshop on affirmations oh, how do we good. how do we turn some of the bad things that we say about ourselves mm-hmm. around into positive um so we do focus a lot on women sure it's great um a lot of my clients are are male too gay males mm-hmm. who come in and some of them don't even know they were exposed oh. um i have one client wow. who's new who had no idea and he he was shocked because he sure. hadn't had sex in such a long time. Mm-hmm. But as Chris said, it can incubate in the body for such a long time before right. showing any signs. Mm-hmm. Wow. So it's, it's, it's just, like we said, it can touch anyone. So really when someone like your client comes in who didn't know that they were exposed and then gets this diagnosis, is it really just they're in shock and they're coming to you just don't even know where to start? You know, it varies. Um, some of my, I've had a few clients who have been newly diagnosed who come in and they're, I, I figured this was going to happen. I okay. was just waiting. Oh, okay. okay. Well, then where, what's our next steps? Meet the client where they're at. Sure. Um, I have some clients who are shocked because mm-hmm. I haven't had sex in months. Right. I don't know what's going on. Uh-huh. Why is this happening to me? Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, and I, again, meet them where they're at. Um, and I have some clients who are just, completely broken by this diagnosis my job is to help them understand what's happening to their bodies Uh basic basic sense because Mm -hmm. i'm not a doctor i'm not a nurse um i am a social worker but i let them know what's going on with their um what what the virus is what it does to the body the life cycle of the virus and what it does to the cd4 account um the cd4 cells in our bodies are kind of like our fighter cells their health are help are like they're basically what keep our it what keeps our immune system our immune system. Sure. The virus attacks those cells, so I I help clients understand what's going on with their with their body right now, and what can be done about it. What can be done about it is getting them in care. Mm-hmm. That's my job. I I connect them to doctors oh, nice. who are um, 
who are um, infectious disease specialists, and I can connect them with um, insurance, Medicaid, and then if they need private, we, t- we have another route through SCHN that can help with that. Nice. And then also medications. The medications are so expensive. I believe mm-hmm. easy $3,000 a month for wow. these pills if you're paying out of pocket. We have something called in Colorado called the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. It's called ADAP. So many acronyms ADAP. in my job. <laughs> um, ADAP is um, a state-run um, program that assists clients with their um, premiums, co-pays. If they need private insurance, we have a great guy at work named John Bergino and a great gal named Kelly DeMuth, and they assist our clients in maintaining their insurance. Oh, wow. And that's at no cost to them if you nice. meet the federal, the federal poverty limit that we have, sure. which is at 500%. And that basically means as a single person, make about $5,000 a month gross, which is quite a bit of money, yeah, I think. <laughs> right. And you can get our assistance. Nice. That's better than food stamps. Yeah. Oh, way better. <laughs> food stamps is at 138%. Yeah. That's about 1200 <laughs> yes. a month. Yep. I know too much. Yeah. Yeah. I'm right there with you. We, yeah. yeah. Well, this is, that's Daniel's job yeah. is to know this I was, stuff. So. I was going to ask, do you guys assist with getting uh, Social Security benefits for them as well? We do not. We had a couple of people who were trained in that. And um, and then, you know, the training lapses. You have to get renewed every year. Mm-hmm. We don't. But we do refer out. Um, I refer right. out to you guys a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but we help with, um, we have a food bank. So it's that housing first model, right? Like, yes. yeah. if mm-hmm. a client doesn't have housing, if a client doesn't have food, if a client doesn't have yep. benefits, anything, anything. Yeah. health is going to be their last possible, that's yep. going to be the last yeah. thing on their mind. Yeah. Right. Getting my meds is going to be the last thing on their mind if they're starving on the street. Yeah. Or, or they're worried about where they're going to sleep that night because they're bed hopping mm-hmm. right. and their friend yeah. is done with them, you right. know? Yeah. So... Another thing that I do is, like, I, I access something called Ryan White funding. Ryan I don't know White. if you all know who Ryan mm-hmm. White was. Yes. Okay, Ryan White was a young boy who was diagnosed, I believe, in the early, in the late 80s? Late 80s. Late yeah. 80s. He was like 15. His mother, he was a hemophiliac. Yeah. His mother had was giving doing what she was supposed to do, giving him those blood products to keep him alive. Yeah. And... One of those stashes of blood products was contaminated with HIV virus. Yeah. I will say that today, all blood, all products like that are screened. Yes. More than once. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it's not. A- it's not a concern now, but at the time, there were people that contracted HIV from blood products mm-hmm. yeah. that hospitals gave them. And yeah. Ryan White was one of those young men who, who contracted it that way. Um, his mother, after Ryan White passed away, I believe it was 1994. Mm-hmm. I'm not positive on that date, passed away. His mother um, went to the government mm-hmm. and created this, this, I don't know, fund, this act, the Ryan White Act. Okay. And um, that was a, that act from that comes to this Ryan White funding okay. where I can help people with their rent if they're about oh, to be evicted. Wow. I'm about to do that today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can help people with utility assistance. One thing I always tell my clients is, Amazing. come to me if you get an eviction notice. Come to me if you get a disconnect notice from Colorado Springs Utilities. The last thing I ever want to happen is for you to be without heat yeah. in the winter. The last thing I ever want you to be is homeless. Mm-hmm. And it's something I could prevent. Right. So please come to me. So right, right. these are just some of the things that I do at work. And it's so cool. I could go on and on, actually. Um, <laughs> so cool. That's great, because yeah. we're going to make you. <laughs> that sounds you. good. Talk a little bit about the mental health component. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so behavioral health, you know, it affects all of us. We, mm-hmm. we say behavioral health now. Mm-hmm. You know, terms change all the time. Yes. Mental health, behavioral health, it's interchangeable in my, in my mind. Um, for the longest time, we did not have behavioral health services at, at Southern Colorado Health Network. We referred out to Aspen Point. We referred out to private. You know, we had a connection with a therapist who we sent people off to. Um, and that was working out great mm-hmm. for a while. Mm-hmm. But then we got all this funding. Don't you love when, what, what <laughs> happens when you get money? <laughs> <laughs> we got all this funding, and we were able to hire a full-time behavioral health person oh, at amazing. Southern Colorado Health Network. We had one for the longest time. Um, for about a year, 
and she was getting it was slow to start i won't lie to you it was slow to start Mm -hmm. but soon we were getting she was booked we couldn't give her any more referrals and then we got to hire a new one we have two behavioral health people right now at our at our agency and it's amazing um and that's how from that money that is how we're able to pull for this woman's retreat we're gonna have because all of that is behavioral health yeah and that's i think the budget's like three thousand dollars it may be a little bit it's not a lot of money when you think about three thousand dollars for um a good three days for 15 or 16 people Mm -hmm. no it's not because we're feeding them when you look at the services and the activities that you're going to provide to them a lot of it isn't tangible Mm -hmm. it really is you know let's talk about you know an affirmation yeah um things that are priceless yeah the things that you are you're you're going to be able to gain are not pieces of of material yes it's going to be something that they're going to be able to apply in their lives and Mm -hmm. and that's I mean, three thousand bucks. I'm thinking, God, the things we could do with that <laughs> is is just amazing to me, and and that's a good size budget for for a an retreat. organization. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, wow, I'm, I want to go. <laughs> we give these women, um, we give these women so many things. Last year, I did the closing ceremonies. I'm going to do the closing ceremonies again this year. Last year, I just spoke about my own journey and sure. trying to find myself and mm-hmm. and releasing some of those negative impacts of my life. And we had. It was hor- it was not to go in too much into it because of course confidentiality, but there were tears. Sure, from a lot of the girls, from a lot of the yeah. women, realizing their strength. A lot of it is strength seeking, strength right. finding. Um, you're not tainted because mm-hmm. of HIV. Right. You're not unworthy because mm-hmm. of HIV. Yep. This is a virus that is inside of you. It does mm-hmm. not make you less valuable. Yep. And that's really what we try to give these women yep. the idea that they have value. I think what complicates it for most people is the fact that sex is involved with having the virus. Yeah. And it really complicates in people's minds their worthiness. Yeah. And um, I hear that, I heard that a lot. And um, I don't know what you say to something, someone like that, who has that um, feeling that I did something, it's my fault, Mm -hmm. um, I deserve bad things to happen it it, you can really go down that rabbit hole Mm -hmm. yes you can and it's um and mental health um i think you have to have a good solid mental health uh capacity in order to bring yourself physically up yeah and um it's hard for some people should we talk about sex a little bit yeah why not let's Let's talk talk about about how you how you get aids or how you get the hiv virus yeah, let's let's not have you sing let's that. Let's talk okay? about sex, baby. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Alex, like, I got this. Yeah. I'll I'll happily serenade <laughs> you. Go. As you know, Daniel turns on his yes. phone like a lighter. Like, yes, <laughs> sing it. <laughs> let's talk about all the good things, See, the bad things it. that may be. See, hey. now, you, now you've got See? Our, down this rabbit I'm, hole. We're gonna do the remix <laughs> <laughs> right after the show. Okay. So seriously, though, sex. Um, how can how can HIV be? Let's first talk about transmission, Chris. Do you want to go into how sex how it's transmitted? I know I know Bring all about on. transmission. You can get it from air, like people <laughs> breathing the air from saliva, being in someone's bubble, uh, being in someone's bubble. Mm-hmm, as yes. I move over beside Becca, oh, no, um, you can get it from touching door handles. No, I'm I'm literally just throwing out all You're the out myths. The myths. Yes. Yes. yes, right. Yep. So let's let's get into the truth about it. Being let's get in the, into the same facts. Classroom. So in the right. in the beginning, in 1982, when I first heard about this. Um, the gay community did not know what caused the transmission of HIV. We knew about about that time that it was from a virus. Mm-hmm. And so um, because people were getting pneumocystis pneumonia, um, they took the smoke machines out of the bars because they thought maybe it's from the smoke machines in the bars. <laughs> wow. This is true. And yeah. also they, there was this thing called poppers, and you could buy them every time you uh, went up to the counter to – um, pay your cover to go in the, uh-huh. in the bar. Uh-huh. Um, they stopped selling poppers and they didn't, again, that was something that was in jet, um, um, inhaled, sm- inhaled, inhaled and huffed. Oh, okay. Um, well, they don't do that we'll much talk anymore. About that later. I have yeah. no idea what <laughs> yeah. that is. I know. Back to poppers. But, so, uh, so, and also we stopped, um, kissing each, um, each other in the mouth. We stopped drinking after each other. It was very, very scary time. It sounds like it was more of a panic reaction. Right. It was. And the bars kind of cleared out. Like the bars in 1980 were different than the bars in 83. In just two years, it was just like, 
I'm mean, scared to go out. Mm. And so um, the myth was that you could get it from saliva, you can get it from eating after someone, you can get it from casual contact, from yeah. sitting on a, on a toilet, toilet seat. seat. Yes. Oh, from playing, wow. playing basketball with yes. someone. Oh, because it's because yeah, of the sweat. sweat. Yes. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, someone, if someone bled on you, which is kind of controversial, if they mm-hmm. bleed on you, you're not likely to get it. There is a chance, but then you have to have an open wound as well. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So okay. the doctors explained it to us at Southern Colorado Health Network. Um, HIV is a lot harder to get than you think. You have to have very intimate contact with another human being that has the virus. It's not the term you used when we were talking off. It is not. You have to have very <laughs> intimate contact. <laughs> don't use this. He's like, you know what? Do not make me say exactly what <laughs> no, I said don't, before. No, please don't. All right. So <laughs> you want to say what the, what the different things are? Yeah. So um, the virus can be spread through five different fluids of the body. Okay. So breast milk. That's surprising to most people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, we um, state that new mothers should not breastfeed. So even if they are undetectable, and we'll get into what Mm -hmm. undetectable means in a few moments. Um, Blood, semen, vaginal fluids, and anal secretions. I believe those are the five, right? Mm -hmm. I said five. Mm -hmm. Um, And those are the fluids that can spread the the virus. Gotcha. Um, So let's talk about semen and anal secretions. Why don't we? Why not? And vaginal secretions. So sex, right? People have sex all the time. It's a natural, normal human thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, if two men are having sex and one is the insertive partner or the top, mm-hmm. and one is a, the, what is it? Receptive partner. Receptive partner uh-huh. or the bottom. Uh-huh. Um, the facts are that the bottom partner is more receptive to catching HIV. Mm-hmm. It's just gotcha. a fact of life. It just makes sense. Yeah, that just mm-hmm. makes sense. It, it, just, that's yes. a, it just makes sense. It yeah. just makes sense. Yeah. Uh-huh. And the same thing for women. Like, um, women are typically the receptive partner, correct? Mm-hmm. I mean... Um, just anatomy, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> women have a higher chance of receiving the virus, as we've previously stated in this podcast. Women have a pretty right. big chance of, of mm-hmm. getting it. Um, blood, um, needle, needles. The use of needles. Sharing, mm-hmm. sharing syringes. Sharing, Sh- sharing yeah. syringes um, is a major, a major point of contraction. Um, you can't get it from kissing. You even though can't. even though saliva is one of the yes, if you have like major open, at least what did the doctor if, say? Like like um, ulcers in your mouth or something. Like you bite your your mouth you and you bit have your open mouth. Wound. Okay. Um, and the person who's kissing you has a very 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 high um, level of, of the virus in their system. Okay. okay, it is possible, but it is not probable. Okay, wow. so there's a difference between possibility and probability. Gosh. What about through or- oral sex? Because it would seem to me that that would be like the highest. It's the same thing. It it's would be if okay. someone has a high um, viral uh-huh. load okay. and um, they are um, inserting their penis into a person, uh-huh. um, whatever it is, there's always a chance that other person can get it. But there is, as far as I know, the last thing I read, I didn't read it this last night, but um, there is... There are no cases of someone contracting it through oral sex. Wow. Yeah. And I would think that would that, be like the highest. Yeah, me too. Because people would be like, oh, I'm trying to be safe. You know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> we'll do so, it this way. So this, right. is a, this is not really a secret about HIV, but um, HIV is very, um, it's it's easily easily killed. Okay. So if, if you expose the virus to the air or expose it to the um, the acid in your saliva, uh-huh. which is pretty high, mm-hmm. um, it can die within seconds. Mm-hmm. Mm. So um, you can't, unlike, say, for example, um, hepatitis C, mm-hmm. you can get that from dry blood on a tabletop. Yeah. Really? You yeah. can get hepatitis C from That's dry blood podcast. on a tabletop. Yeah. We'll have Definitely. to talk about that And now. by the way, <laughs> about three years ago, they and they uh, came up with a cure for hepatitis C. It has cured a lot of our co-mobility mobility people. People have know. HIV and hep and C. Hep C. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, if there is blood on a tabletop and you touch it and you 
put it right here near your mouth or eyes, uh-huh. you have a chance of getting hep wow. C. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So HIV could be a lot worse. Yeah, yeah. true. It could be That's a lot true. worse. Yeah. There are about 1.1 million people in the United States that currently have HIV. Um, um, and there are 18% of people, I read this last night, who don't know it. So I would say 190,000 people are walking around with HIV don't that don't know it. Know it. Wow. So the, the issue is get yourself checked. Right. Mm-hmm. And so does the, the Southern Colorado Health Network do free testing? or We do free it... testing. Okay. Free do hep C and HIV free testing. Okay. Um, we have a great prevention group. They do so much, including PrEP, and I would love to get into that in a moment as well. Sure. Um, but basically, if you want to get tested, please call the number 578 nine zero nine two again the number is five seven eight nine zero nine two and just say you want to get tested for hiv or hep c um hep c there are quite a few things you have to kind of like they don't just do that Mm willy-nilly you need to meet the criteria like you've you've shared needles um you've had sex with somebody who you know shares needle you're a sex worker there's lots of little bits nuances there but HIV. I mean, right. as long as you aren't a frequent flyer, as we say, and you get tested every month, because those sure. tests are expensive, sure. um, you can come in and get tested for free. Wow. Which is pretty awesome. It's a rapid test, so you'll know within, I believe it's, well, we say 15 minutes, but I mean, it shows up pretty quickly. Okay. And you're with one of a trained counselor with you doing the test. Okay. Could you describe the, that process of the testing? Like, what does the testing look like? It's a finger prick. Okay. You're not oh. drawing blood. It's a finger prick. Um, it's a lancer is what we call mm-hmm. it, a lancer. Um, I've never done the test myself because I'm not in prevention. Mm-hmm. But what I know of it is you're sitting in a room with somebody who's making you feel, one of our prevention people, they all make you feel pretty safe, very safe, in fact. Um, they, they prick your finger. They put it on, what, it almost looks like an old-fashioned birth control test. <laughs> oh, I gotcha. And then, okay. Yes, and then it comes up. Um or a birth, a birth pregnancy test, mm-hmm. pardon me. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll know very soon. Mm, gotcha. Now, if you do become positive, if you are tested positive, um, you have to do something called, a, something called a confirmatory test. Okay. Somebody from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment comes down to our offices to meet you. And we do the, the she does a blood draw. Gotcha. A blood draw test just to make sure that our test was accurate. Because, you know, there's always duds. Mm-hmm. Um, and once that happens, um, a case manager is called in. Normally, I'll admit it's me because I've been okay. there for six years. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm pretty good in a crisis. Sure. Um, and my supervisor knows that, so she calls me. And, sure. <laughs> um, and we'll sit with you. And if you're ready, we'll tell you what what the next steps are for you. Sure. So it's pretty much how the process goes. Does that... When you do the initial test and it comes back positive, is it the same day that another that health um, worker will come down and do the test, or is it delayed by a day because of scheduling and stuff? Sometimes it is delayed by a day okay. because of scheduling. Okay. It could be delayed up to, I think, up to a week. Okay. But we try to keep tabs on everyone, okay. make sure they know there's somewhere safe for them to go. Sure. We have, like like we said, we have behavioral health on site. Sure. So if somebody needs some intensive, like a little bit of something else um, that the tester cannot provide, sure. we have that. Okay. Um, we really just try to make, I try to make sure that a new diagnosis knows that this is not a death sentence. Yeah. This also is not the end of your sex life. Because, yeah. um, <laughs> believe me, I mean, I think about what would I be afraid of. I would feel like I could never have sex again. Right. I could never be intimate with my partner again. I could never right. experience that once more. Right. And I try to make sure that my new clients know that that is not the case. Right. And that I got gotcha. you. Mm-hmm. I got gotcha. you. Right. I know how to get your medications. I know how to get you to the doctor. Right. And I know how to keep you safe. Because something that people I would love to mention is... Um, the you equals you um, thing we got going on now. Mm-hmm. You equals you means untra- un- undetectable means equals untransmittable. So if your viral load is undetectable, the chances of you giving it to somebody else is it's almost I think non-existent. 96%. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's kind of preven- where prevention is going now. Let's get gotcha. people undetectable. Sure. And the best way I can do that is by getting you to the doctor getting on your meds and getting you connected with ADAP, Age Drugs 
assistance program mm-hmm. so we can get you on medications and have you not worry about that. The sure. lovely things about the medications now is we have a lot of um, single tablet regimens. Mm-hmm. That means back in the 90s, people were taking handfuls. handfuls. Yeah. yeah. Handfuls Ever of pills. I do remember that. Yeah. Tons of side effects. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now we have, most of my clients have one pill they take. Amazing. They have the single drug regimens were like had three medications in them. We're down to two. Wow. <laughs> What's more than what's more is we are um, when I say we I mean I don't know HIV mm-hmm. um, they're working on an injection a once a month injection wow. that you can take it's in it's in human trials right now to so we're almost um, there we're almost there we get closer and closer to a cure every day I feel like mm-hmm. um, we also have something else that's pre- for prevention called prep prep is pre exposure prophylaxis it is a actually it's an hiv drug that they used to use oh chris help me out what is it called? truvada 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 has three drugs in it taken daily it can reduce your risk of transmitting hiv by i believe 96 percent as well oh wow a, re- a receipt or get, getting hiv yeah getting, getting HIV. HIV. pardon me yes okay. getting it can it can stop your chances of getting hiv by about 96 percent wow. but that is that doesn't include when you're sharing needles is that right it does not include that that is correct let them learn contact is way different way scary and we actually have a needle exchange program down in pueblo nice so this is just southern colorado right like i'm running 25 i'm i'm personally personally running 25 (laughs) counties it's amazing you can even come and stop by and talk to us you're so busy our agency has a needle exchange program down in pueblo and that's kind of our way of combating that fact. We can't, Truvada does not help you from okay. getting HIV if you are sharing needles. Um, so the takeaway is if you're sharing needles, you likely will not be able to use this drug. Exactly. Right. So to be very careful when you are using needles. Yes. You when don't you, have to share needles, guys. No. They're readily available. We have yes. clean needles. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, um,. I'll say a little about about El Paso Please. County. We mm-hmm. um, tried to get this passed a couple of years ago. It did not pass the Board of Health. Mm-hmm. The Board of Health makes decisions on um, programs like like ours. And uh-huh. um, in comparison, Pueblo unanim- unanimously voted um, and are very proud of us and mm-hmm. are proud of uh, Pueblo has a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, there's Sounds not like an invisible that. fence at the border between Pueblo and El Paso counties. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I'll just say that sure. um, the Board of Health here did not see the wisdom in it. That's unfortunate. Although we know yes. that people from El Paso County go down to Pueblo. To and, exchange their needles. Yes, to exchange their needles. Um, they give us their used needles. We dispose of them properly. Mm-hmm. And they get clean needles. Clean needles. Clean needles and they also get... Um, syringe use supplies okay. like a tourniquet okay. like cookers we make cookers out of like this like little bottle cap looking thing sure and um little um medically medical cotton balls sure inside clean water and bleach in order to have safer injection use um i'm actually able to i'm not allowed to give needles mm-hmm. like here in el paso it, county here yeah. in el paso county mm-hmm. but for my clients I'm allowed to give um, give those like supplies, like the tourniquet, like the little tr- like the little cookers with the cotton ball in it, um, like the bleach, um, just so I can help my clients have like it's it's risk reduction, it's harm reduction. Mm-hmm. Let's make it safer. We can't make right. it the safest by giving you a clean needle. Mm-hmm. Let's reduce some of the risk by giving you these supplies, yeah. which I think is really proactive, um, and within our own environment in El Paso County is probably like you do what and mm-hmm. why do you do that you're mm-hmm. just you're now you're just enabling and that's in my in my perspective I don't believe it's enabling I think it's protecting the health and safety mm-hmm. of Everyone. our citizens yeah. and so to understand you're actually giving them stuff so that they can do drugs mm, that's really not the point the, the point truly is we want to make sure everybody is safe yeah. so we're going to give them the the, the the means to do that yeah 
it's not that we are giving school children <laughs> <laughs> this stuff and saying go out and just do this. Right. Yes. These people, the people who come to us, are already addicted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We have um, counseling services for them. We have mm-hmm. referral services to um, um, addict- uh, addictive counseling outside of us, sure. and um, these people are already addicted, and yeah. so they need help. And they come to us. And so um, the needle exchange program, I think, is four or five years old now in Mm -hmm. Pueblo. And it was a slow start. I was there, and it Mm -hmm. started. And all of us had a big question mark about where is this going to go. Is this going to even be a thing? Now now, um, it's enormous. And and we are are recognized by the city for the work we do in Pueblo. They had to um, go from one day a week to two days a week. Wow. And they have a new, we don't, it's, we're not part of it, CHN isn't part of it, mm-hmm. but they have another needle exchange program in Pueblo as well, serving the community. So, I mean, there is a, definitely a need, mm-hmm. and it grows every single every single month. It feels like my, um, my like I'm in charge, um, our, <laughs> Again. Uh, <no>. our <laughs> prevention manager, we have prevention manager down there who h- helps with the, who runs the needle exchange program. He's amazing. Um, every single staff meeting, it feels like he's giving us new numbers that have just grown oh. exponentially. Exponentially, That's It's amazing. amazing how many people we help. We also give out, um, I believe it's called Narcan. Yes. Oh, yes. And we give out, um, oh, shoot, um, fentanyl testing strips. Okay. Fentanyl is a, <laughs> it's a pretty heavy drug mm-hmm. that they're lacing methamphetamine and heroin with right now. Mm-hmm. And you can OD on it so easily. Oh my god! As far as I'm really upset with gets you really high. And took my favorite artist. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's all good. So, um, you know what fentanyl is then? Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Prince, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it can <laughs> we give out fentanyl testing strips? The people can test their drugs that they purchase to see what's going on. That's We've heard great. accounts that people are throwing away their drugs. Wow, fentanyl's in it. They throw it away, that's good. which is amazing. That is amazing. That and is Narcan amazing. is a way to. Um, Someone's overdosing. Give them, them Narcan. It yeah. brings them back. Yeah. Nice. Usually within a minute. Surprisingly, mm-hmm. within a minute. Yeah. So that person comes out of. So I wanted okay. to go back to the testing side of things for mm-hmm. individuals. I, I definitely know that going to a doctor or to um, to see uh, Alex mm-hmm. at her job to be tested is probably the best setting because you'll have on-site um, support. Mm -hmm. if diagnosed correct but for the individuals that are afraid to Mm -hmm. go out um are there ways that they can test at home in the you know in in a private setting um are there any yes okay can we talk about that of course thank you for bringing that up daniel we can go down you can go down to walgreens and pick Mm -hmm. up an hiv testing kit um similar i mean to a I always think pregnancy tests, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Similar to that, but you know, you. I think it's a. I think it's a, inside your mouth swab, mm-hmm. okay. like on the, on your inner cheek. Okay. And you can get tested. The dangers there, of course, is n- if there's nobody there to support you. Yeah. When you get test positive. positive. Yeah. 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 Also, um, the test, I believe, you have to mail it off. So oh, it's not man. like an instant. So you have the time you test to the time you get the results. Man. So thinking about it's like this. back in the day, thinking, man. Thinking. It used to be scary yeah. waiting on your test mm-hmm. to come back. You'd be like, man, I'm not doing nothing. To you get that, that phone call. <laughs> like, come down to the office. We mm-hmm. need to see you. And right. Yeah. I just go back to the. There's an episode of Sex in the City. Mm. Oh yes. <laughs> just watch that episode, and I'm like Samantha. Yes, Samantha, and you're like, oh, yeah, yes. scary. That is scary. We don't take you back to a little room. Mm-hmm. We definitely like. <laughs> you, so when you come into, so you make the appointment, right? You set up the appointment with us, mm-hmm. um, and you come to your appointment. The, our receptionist is, knows what's up. She she understands the mm-hmm. confidentiality factor. She understands sure. the fear that might be there. Sure. All of our staff does. So we treat you with respect. If you want to talk, cool. If you mm-hmm. don't, that's cool too. Yeah. Here at the paperwork, please fill this out. And um, <sighs> Melissa Chismar is our prevention manager. Melissa Chismar will be out with you soon. Mm-hmm. Um, when you when that happens, know that when you come into our building, you're not going to have any. No one's going to see. The word AIDS splashed anywhere, or mm-hmm. or HIV. Mm-hmm. Um, for a long time, it felt like we had our sign up, our Southern Colorado AIDS Project sign up for a long time, mm-hmm. um, which caused stigma for people, yeah, and shame. But right. now on our on our building, we have the Southern Colorado Health Network, 
so it's more inclusive. It mm-hmm. could be anything. Right. You come in, it's a private private room um, that you go into with your counselor, and you get tested, and then mm. I swear, most of the time, people come out, everyone. I, I think I've seen maybe a handful of positive tests come back, mm-hmm. just as a case manager. Sure. A handful. Right. And just knowing that you're negative mm-hmm. is amazing. Right. Oh, yeah. I encourage people to get tested at their yearly doctor's appointments. Mm-hmm. Sure. Because yeah. Women's wellness appointments, too. You yeah. can request an HIV test from your doctor. A lot yeah. of women don't do that. Yeah. yeah. So is it true that when they test, uh, let's say if you're getting labs done, mm-hmm. um, if you do not ask for um, HIV testing mm-hmm. um, that or metals testing for, for that case, mm-hmm. um, is it true that they will not? It's not part lines. of the regular routine. No. Right. So you should definitely be testing. proactive and, yeah. asking and ask. Yeah. Okay. About three years ago, I had a scare. Two, two, three years ago, I had a scare, and I went down and um, to my doctor for my, for my you know, yearly exam, mm-hmm. and I had to ask, mm-hmm. like, hey, can we get me a full screen, mm-hmm. full screen, HIV, everything? And she's like, yeah, that's not, that's not really included, but we'll do it. Well, why isn't it included? It right. should be included every year. It should be a yearly thing you do. Everybody. It's preventative health. Mm-hmm. Right. I fully believe is. that not just for, for men who have sex with men, but for everyone. Yeah. Right. It's a health. It's That's the only way we're going to stop HIV. That's the only way we're going to stop AIDS. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know if little kids still do this, but we used to do like bro- blood brothers and blood sisters, and we yeah. would cut our fingers and yeah. rub them together, and now we're brother and sister, you know, <laughs> yeah. and that can be very dangerous in this climate, you yeah. know, and children should be tested as well. Like, mm-hmm. the, it's yeah. it's starting at a younger age now as far as sexual activity, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Yeah. we need to make sure that our children are being tested. Just because they're right. kids doesn't mean that they're not, they're they don't feel that they're grown, you yeah. know? <laughs> exactly. And uh, if, if everybody is tested when labs are done, then that mm-hmm. could help yeah. tremendously with being able to get it under control. Yeah, you know? that's so true. I believe we should make it part of our um, yearly sexual health exam. Yeah. yeah. You know, like I said, human sexuality, sex positivity, mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with it, and there's yeah. nothing wrong with knowing if you're HIV positive. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, man. God, I learned so much. That's awesome. And there's so much. Like, I was, <laughs> I, I was on my phone last night for at least an hour and a half just going through the rabbit hole of yeah. I won't even say rabbit hole because it was true knowledge like the mm-hmm. history mm-hmm. of it all and yeah. there's so many things that I was told about it that was not <laughs> true. true and this I was just like, like disability oh we have all those myths about yeah. right. interacting with the person with the disability yeah yeah and you're like what do you mean that's a thing right that. I'm, I'm looking at the history like <laughs> where's the chimpanzees <laughs> yes. there are no chimpanzees yes. this story can't be right yeah exactly <laughs> right. exactly so. And we're more likely to remember the stuff like the sensationalized things mm-hmm. right. than facts. Right. right. And even now, um, you know, I consider both of you very learned. And so, you know, setting the record straight or getting the facts mm-hmm. is important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, for all people who are listening. Yeah. It is exactly. important. Um, so, you know, what I, what I want to touch on before we, we end is we just celebrated in July – the um, the passing of the ADA, the 29th anniversary, mm-hmm. and we know that um, that HIV is considered a disability. Um, but was it originally recognized when the ADA passed? Yeah, 1990, it was recognized as um, a disability, and people, though at the time they didn't they didn't recognize asymptomatic or people who did not have symptoms. Okay. They only recognized people with symptoms of HIV okay. or uh, if it had advanced to AIDS. Okay. In 1998, there was a court case, um, the first one ever to go before the Supreme Court, that the ADA recognized um, asymptomatic people as well gotcha. as uh, people who are covered by the ADA. So, I mean, whatever the ADA, ADA says, mm-hmm. um, there are still instances we understand Okay. That we have heard from people pretty recently that I got fired because they found out I had AIDS or I've, they, no. I, I was just, kind of pushed out of my apartment because they found out I had HIV. So the stigma is real. It's there. And it's there. It's not so much um, – and people really feel justified in their 
attitudes toward yep. HIV mm-hmm. and AIDS mm-hmm. or people with HIV and AIDS. Right. And not so much the same for blind people or people in wheelchairs, yeah. mm-hmm. but they feel justified in their mm-hmm. discrimination. That's the, the stigma. When you, when you talked about the stigma between, um, you know, the having AIDS and then the association of how you get AIDS yes. is sex. And yeah. when you put those together, um, it does become like a moral justification mm-hmm. yes. to right. treat someone mm-hmm. a, a particular way because they have a diagnosis. And that is just just shocking to Y'all me. Y'all don't want to get me started on yeah. that. <laughs> you know, I don't think I don't there's know. ever been um, a disability where someone says, you deserve that because mm-hmm. you're in a wheelchair. You deserve yeah. to be blind. And right. or whatever mm-hmm. that disability is, uh, I know in the Bible Belt of the United States, it was hard. Mm-hmm. Um, preachers, ministers were preaching from the pulpit yeah. that Did we sh- we should discriminate yeah. against these people. These mm-hmm. these people yeah. mm-hmm. are, not, are not like us. Yep. Amazing. Frankly, we're all human, mm-hmm. and the first initial in HIV is human immunodeficiency virus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're all human, so we yep. deserve to be treated that way. Yeah. No. I don't remember if you guys. I don't know if you guys remember a movie called Philadelphia. Yes, yes. it came out. In, mm-hmm. That's what's in my mind right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it came out in um, the early '90s. I don't remember watching it. I was like 13 years old, and um, I think that's part of the reason why I got into this work is because I, I was like, that's just horrible. Yeah. yeah. Um, basically, Tom Hanks' character gets fired mm-hmm. once his he's a lawyer and he gets fired because he his supervisors, his partners know that he or suspect that he has HIV. Um, and it goes into the ADA. It goes into why this was discrimination. Mm-hmm. He's not. Well, it goes into why this is wrong. Yeah. So if anybody has any downtime tonight and wants to go on Netflix, <laughs> please yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, take a watch. Yeah. I mean, definitely, it, it, it's real and it's mm-hmm. still happening today. Yeah. yeah. We don't hear about it as much. Thank goodness. Right. I mean, but many it many is people still do happening. think younger people, especially, they think AIDS, HIV. I thought that went away. Yeah. It's it really has never not. gone away. No, and it has not. Unfortunately, when you know in the disability community, we do not really um, want to associate ourselves with the medical right. field. It's just we've been um, traumatized and stigmatized, and you yeah. know, any of the eyes is we have <laughs> we have had some sort of interaction with the medical um, community. However, that medical community has advanced so far that. Um, that individuals that are, you know, probably in their early 20s truly do think, didn't it go away? Mm-hmm. Because the the medical advances to keep uh, the virus under control yeah. um, have, have you know, really kind of yeah. caused this topic to not be a topic anymore. And here in, in El Paso County, I know in District 11, um, sex ed- education cannot include the mention of a condom. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. And so even a depiction of a condom, a cartoon condom dancing in a PowerPoint is called out. What? And so it's too bad that this is a podcast because I am having a face right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, Can you describe your face? No. <laughs> you don't want me to describe my face. It is surprising. It's surprising to, to know that. Shocking. And so um, I have a little girl. She's mm-hmm. 10 and she will be probably active within five or six years. It's hard to believe that, but not if I can help it. (laughs) So, uh, so we, we are very open and honest with her about age appropriately things that, that she should look out for, uh, especially how other, um, people treat her, other Mm -hmm. men treat her and boys treat her and, um, not to be ashamed of who she is and always take care of yourself. And that's uh, something that if you don't receive that at school, Parents have to step in. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. You have to step in. Yes. Yeah. I was I, I was wondering. So Alex had uh, briefly talked about 20% of individuals that are infected are women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's mostly through down low mm-hmm. sex in the Latino and African American community. Mm-hmm. Is there any correlation to the high population of males that are targeted by our prison system and oh. are incarcerated and then coming out of prison where they may have had sexual intercourse well, in prison yeah. and then come home to their girlfriends or are yeah, not starters. even been tested in prison yeah. oh, they- and then come home and, and this disease is transmitted. 
Well, I think that the prison system for me is a whole other podcast as well because <laughs> um, I have opinions. But um, I I agree with you, Daniel. I, I definitely think that that's definitely a a pretty good reason why this is sure. happening. Sure. Um, we know that sex happens in prison. Mm-hmm. Some of it's they consensual. It the Some state. of it's not it's consensual. consensual. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me at all. If I, I know, anecdotally, I that. We, we say that all the time. We right. there is no quantitative evidence, sure. um, but anecdotally, it's um, we might need to look into that. I think yeah. maybe, maybe we need to. That would be a right. good study. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Take a look at that because <laughs> maybe but, we need to have more testing in the system where there are high populations of one sex. Yeah. Um, and yeah. unfortunately, we know the statistics of the amount of uh, of the the the, um, the races that are yeah. incarcerated. We do. Yeah. Yes. So really, it's it's almost a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You would think so. Well, also teaching children about condoms are no brainer, but you know, look at that. Situation. Again, another podcast. <laughs> May For another I? day when we're likely let's you know calm down from just hearing that. <laughs> Can I share a small anecdote about a- sure. anecdote about my daughter that might perk sure. people up a little bit? Mm-hmm. Um, so this was Pride. My daughter's also like Chris. Mm-hmm. Chris's daughter. Um, she's been raised. Right. With Hearing the Southern Colorado stuff, Health right. Network. I've been, um, she helps at Pride, mm-hmm. my daughter. And about three years ago, she was 12, 11, 12. She's helping with the wheel. We had a wheel of questions. Oh, okay. So this gentleman spins the wheel. And the question is, how many, what are the five fluids, we learned this today, what are the five <laughs> fluids that HIV is transmitted with mm-hmm. through? And the guy was like, I can't say that to you. She's like, no, no, no. My mom works here. Like, <laughs> I've been around for years. I'm like their mascot. Like, <laughs> I'm good. And the guy was not able to say that to her. And part of that might have been like, you, you shouldn't know this. You're 11. Mm-hmm. Right. There, it's never too young. Right. Age never. appropriate, of course, but it's never right. too young to teach our children to be about safe. sex, sex positivity, yeah. um, not shaming them, yeah, but body teaching them about yeah. as well. how to be respected and respectful. Yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. Not doing anything that consent. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want to have sex. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. And cool. going with your gut when you're not comfortable. And yeah. that is, it's really hard as a parent to be able to teach your child that. Um, and I'm so grateful that my child is older. Um, but, you know, when I went back and I started thinking about in, in preparation for this conversation is like, when did I have that conversation? How old was she? And um, and I had to go back and think and think and think. And, and I remember her going, you know, I don't need to know that. I am too young. And I'm like, oh, you will know this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if you're eight years old. You're going to learn. <laughs> and um, and I had to call her. And, I, and you remember that conversation we had? And she goes, it was so uncomfortable. I was only eight. <laughs> I was like, did I traumatize you? She's like, no, but I, I appreciate that you did that mm-hmm, because yeah. I still remember your voice in my head. I'm like, oh, nice. I am the That's voice good. in her head. Is that That's good. Haunting her already. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, 20 years later, I'm still the voice in your head, which is great. Um, but I think that, you know, if you if you really do the quality job of how you educate your children, mm-hmm. they will carry that forward and they will have the empowerment to say no. Definitely. And be able to say, okay, I need to get tested and know that you're a safe person. So when that, that diagnosis comes back, that that they know that they can come to you and go, this is, this is what I'm looking at. Right. And you have their back. And, and a big piece that I want to let all parents know is make sure that you educate yourself first. Yeah. Yes. And make sure that you are passing down correct information mm-hmm. to your children. Yeah. And um, do your, you know, due diligence and do some research and really find out the true ways that it's transmitted. Really find out the true history of it. Um, and with any sexually transmitted disease and you you want to make sure that you're passing on good information to the kids you know exactly okay yeah. thank you guys thank, thank you, you. Yeah. great conversation awesome i i enjoyed this and i learned a lot definitely yeah yeah again i'm so grateful my child is older anyway so um <laughs> uh alex how do people get a hold of you um you can call my call the office southern colorado health network um the number is 719 719- Five seven eight nine zero nine two. Again, that number is seven one nine five seven eight nine zero nine two. We are located at one three zero one South Eighth Street in Colorado Springs. It's kind of on the 
West Side. Um, <laughs> that's a really nice view of the mountains, by the way. Yes, yeah. very beautiful office. Um, and like I said, if you do think that you might be HIV positive, please come down and get tested. If you already are HIV positive and you need linkage to service, please call us. We'll do a referral. A request for care is what we call it. Sure. Um, and we have, oh gosh, about, oh gosh, we have like six case managers in yes. our office. Nice. Um, and you'll go to one of us. And we will serve you the best way we can. Nice. Well, um, I will add all that information to um, the podcast description. So if you're listening to this and want to go click on the phone number and call right away, you're welcome to do that. And um, if you are looking for maybe some benefits help and don't know. Yeah, just a little bit. And you don't know where to go, stop off at the Independent Center. Um, We are located downtown in Colorado Springs, 729 South Tejon. Um, or you can give us a call, 719-471-8181, and ask for Daniel. Yeah, and Becca's personal <laughs> phone number is... No, I'm, I'm If you call and ask for me, I may... No, I will pick up the phone. Well, it depends. If it says Daniel Ratcliffe, I don't. Uh, usually yeah. not. No. <laughs> um, on the disability topic, individuals that are diagnosed with HIV or AIDS, um, if it's AIDS, if you have... Uh, people say full-blown AIDS. <laughs> what, right. what is the correct way to... To describe that. Is that pr- progressive? It's, or well, just we still say AIDS? full-blown AIDS. I will okay. say that. Like, I still say full-blown AIDS. I, I don't know if that's correct sure. or not. Okay. Basically, um, Like half-blown AIDS? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? That's yeah, what, I'm like, like, so what does that mean? <laughs> share a little bit about that. I um, So we know that the CD, we talked about CD4 account. Mm-hmm. And your CD4 account, typically for a healthy person, I'm doing mm-hmm. air quotes right now, a healthy person is between 500 and 1500. Okay. okay. That's typically what your CD4 account is. It can fall if you have a cold. It can whatever. Sure. Sure. If you have AIDS, your CD4 count is 200 or below. Okay. Um, I just saw somebody at clinic. I go to Peak Vista for a clinic. That's one of my jobs is Uh to be with the doctor and the nurse and the client and the patient. Um, Somebody who has a CD4 count of 50. Oh, my gosh. Yes. So a cold could take them out. A cold could take them out. Um, Mm. I've seen CD4 counts as low as three. Wow. Really? You want to make sure if you're in, if you if you're HIV positive, you want to get into care. You want to get on your medications yeah. because I'm my hope for this person who I saw mm-hmm. is that she'll she's on her meds now mm-hmm. or his meds, him or her, <laughs> and um, within six hopefully within two months, she'll be back to a healthy level. Nice. That is my hope. Nice. So yeah, that is true. Once you take the drugs to lower your viral, viral load, mm-hmm. it takes six to eight weeks and mm-hmm. it can become undetectable it's amazing wow. Wow. it's it amazing again yes. that relationship between the medical and disability community though right. contentious is, <laughs> is valid <laughs> yeah. so so to the point of uh if if you are diagnosed with aids mm-hmm. through social security you are automatically approved so okay. if there are any listeners that have been diagnosed with AIDS and they do not have Social Security disability benefits, mm-hmm. please contact me, Daniel Ratcliffe, at the Independent Center yep. um, at the number that will be provided in our in our podcast description. Yes. That part. <laughs> that place. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you want the accessible version of this podcast, go to um, YouTube and just type in Real Empowerment and you will get the accessible captioned version. Um, you won't get a video yet right. maybe maybe i don't know maybe we should just record your we face s- no <laughs> how about that I think shiny we smiling face yes no. exactly i'll pass yes thank you guys so much how thank about we record your ponytail yeah it's really <laughs> <pushy>. <laughs> thanks guys we appreciate thank it you. Thank, thank you so much <laughs>